another amen. amen father we thank you and bless your name thank you for your love and mercy and grace thank you for your compassion on everyone without partiality we're asking you lord that tonight your word will penetrate and profit every heart every life in jesus name Amen. lord i pray that the word will do what you intend in every heart every life all our churches everyone hearing in jesus mighty name we pray god bless you you can sit down Tonight, we're still coming to James chapter 2. And in James chapter 2, we're reading from verse 14. It says, What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say, He has faith, and have not works. Can faith, that kind of faith, can faith, inactive faith, can face a faith that doesn't touch, transform, train, and move anyone. Can that kind of faith save him? Tonight, as we come to James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17, we're looking at receiving and retaining God's grace through living faith, not dead faith. If there's anything to talk about, if there's anything to learn, if there's anything to go over and over again in the Word of God, those are two things, grace and faith. How do we get saved? By grace through faith. How do we get steadfast in the Lord, not in our strength? By grace through faith. How are we sanctified? How are we made holy? How are we prepared for heaven? By grace through faith. How do we become steadfast in the Lord, following the Lord, serving the Lord without looking here and there? By grace through faith. How do we endure persecution, suffering when we are persecuted, ill treated, assaulted, insulted for? our faith by grace through faith and that is why we're looking at Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 it says for by grace are you saved through faith isn't that important then by grace are you saved through faith whatever we have whatever we desire and now we want our prayers our requests will be granted by grace through faith and it says and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God it is the gift of God the grace the provision the promise and the things that come from Calvary that come into our hearts into our lives we receive all by grace through faith. So we are looking in death into receiving and retaining God's grace through living faith, not dead faith. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one is the transforming grace. Grace transforms. There are people that do not understand. Grace transforms. They think grace excuses Adam. They think grace excuses depravity. They think grace excuses our sin. After they say they are saved, they are born again, they say, I'm a sinner by grace. No, nobody is a sinner by grace. Nobody is evil by grace. We don't need to have grace to have evil in our lives. We don't have, need to have grace to have depravity operating in our hearts. It's grace that makes a change. Grace that transforms. 
transforming grace through de definite, decisive faith. Number two, trampled grace. The people that trample on the grace of God. In fact, the Bible says, they tread, they trample upon the Son of God Himself. The Bible says, they trample, they walk on. They make it, they make the grace of God vain and they trample on grace, on God, on godliness, on the goodness of Christ. Number two, trampled grace by dead, dead mean faith. Not only that they are dead, they are deadened. They are dead perpetually. They are dead to knowledge. They are dead to the sound of the voice of God from heaven. They are dead to anything, any invitation calling them into the kingdom of God. They are dead to the warnings of God that shows us how to remain, how to abide in the goodness of God, in the grace of God, in the godliness God provided through Christ at Calvary. Trample grace by dead, deadening faith. Number three is triumphing grace. The grace that triumphs over sin, over temptation, over trial, over the furnace of Nebuchadnezzar's fire. The grace that triumphs in trial, in temptation, and in all the difficulties and torments and tortures of life, triumphing grace through this distinct, distinguishing faith. How those people distinguished themselves. Abel distinguished himself from Cain. Enoch distinguished himself from those anti-deluvian, uh, that is, the people that preceded the flood. He distinguished himself. Noah distinguished himself. He heard the word. He feared the judgment. He built the ark for the salvation of his house. Abraham distinguished himself by obedience. And everybody knew the steps he took, the way he went. He was not like the rest of them. That's the kind of grace that triumphs and makes us distinguished, distinct by the faith that we have. We will not be of the, of the common people, of the common uh, you know, men and women that live in a way that they're not different from other people and yet they say they have it. No, when you have the grace of God that triumphs, that overcomes, that conquers, you have the grace of God and you have a distinct, distinguishing faith. Come to number one. Number one, we're looking at transforming grace through definite decisive faith. We're looking at um, Titus chapter 2, reading from verse 11. It says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation appeared as appeared to all. If you have the grace of God, and the grace of God has been accepted, has been received, then it says, it has brought salvation. Salvation. What salvation? That the experience that makes you different from what you were in the past. If you have an experience of salvation, the experience of genuine salvation, the experience of no soul salvation. I know it. I feel it. I sense it in me. It comes to transform and make a change in my life. The grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. In verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly. You see that grace of God, when it comes into our heart, into our life, it teaches us 
It transforms us that we live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at transforming grace through trusting faith. The faith that trusts the Lord. Number two is transparent godliness through tenacious faith. Holding on there. If the life has not been fully changed, holding on there. If the life has to not totally become transparent, holding on there. Because it is that tenacious faith that makes us to have that transparent godliness. In number three is transcending goodness, transcending, transcending, transcending goodness under tried faith. Look at number one. Number one is transforming grace through trusting faith. We're back to Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. It doesn't say it has been accepted by all men. No. It's one thing to provide for all men. It's another thing that everyone individually, wholeheartedly, will accept what has appeared unto him. And when it appears to you, the grace of God, you suddenly realize it's mine. I can have. I can change. I want to change. I want to be transformed. I want to be prepared for heaven. I cannot do it myself. Praise the Lord. The grace of God has come from heaven and it has appeared unto me. What has appeared to me, I accept. It is then that grace of God that brings salvation will make it real in your life. In verse 12, in verse 12 it says, teaching us you see the people that say i have grace i have grace and the grace never instructs them the grace never teaches them how could you do that you now have grace when you didn't have a cutlass you understand your yard was a kind of rough and wieldy but now you have a cutlass you can do it if you want to when you didn't have a pen you couldn't try it but what's the excuse now? You have a pen. When you didn't have the book to read, we could have said, okay, he failed because he didn't have the right book to read. But now you have the right book to read. And you have the brain, you have the eyes, you have the ears, you have a teacher. There's no excuse anymore. It says the grace of God teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws we should live soberly. The people who have grace, they live soberly. They don't live briefless lives. They don't live careless lives. They don't live fleshly lives. They don't live sinful lives. They don't live careless lives. Grace does not make us careless. We say, ah, my friend, why are you doing this? Why are you acting like this? You profess to have grace. Yes, I have grace. Grace, grace. And I'm not living the way I should live, but I have grace. No, you don't have grace. The grace of God. You see, living your fleshly life, you see, living your polluted life, you're living as if you never had any teaching from the word of god but if you really have grace it teaches you that you deny ungodliness temptation to ungodliness you deny worldly lost worldly laws worldly laws you deny you say no do you ever say no to the devil if you don't have grace real grace you'll not say no do you ever say no to temptation, to the tempter, to the temptress? If you can't say no, you don't have grace. And you, the tempter, 
Are you the temptress when Satan instigates you to bring sin to another person? Here we are. We're doing all we can to teach the people of God. And you come in and you must leave some immoral, immoral thought in the mind of another person. We're teaching them, you're pulling them down. We're showing them how the grace of God will make them righteous. And you are influencing them by your fleshly anatomy. That you'll be pulling them down, they will be unrighteous. We're not walking together then. Because we're lifting up, everyone we lift up, you're pulling down by your temptation. As a tempter, as a temptress, but it says, we who are in the Lord, and we have the grace of God, we should live soberly, righteously, godly, in this present world. Have you convinced yourself, this is my bad habit, it's mine, what can I do? This is my way of living. It's evil, I know. What can I do in this present world? I'll keep on and keep on sinning. No. Our lives must be transformed if grace has come into our lives. Look at Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 2. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, your personal life, be not conformed to this world. In your marriage, actually, you know, if, if we're this old, we have seen people who have married before us. And we've seen how they lived. We've seen how they acted, reacted to one another. That's the world. It says that we should be transformed. That's what the grace of God to you and be not conformed to this world. Even before I became born again, real, really born again. You know my story? I was a church boy. I woke up like this. I found myself in church. Sunday school, yes. Services, yes. Morning devotion at home, yes. Everything that appeared Christian, but I saw the world within our house. Daddy and mommy, they've gone to glory now, but at that time, when I was young, they fought a lot. My father spoke, she spoke back, and she knew that my father was going to the next line fighting. And she, she replied, and I said, if marriage is like this, I will not have a marriage like this. I wasn't born again. I, then my mother was forced. Another woman came in. Another woman came in. I didn't have the courage to tell my father, this is not the right way that you're teaching us in the Bible. But I saw the world. But I determined I will not walk in that way. Eventually, when I became born again, now I had the courage to talk to my father. And I said, Father, woman, 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 it's not of God. Polygamy. Well, he didn't have the grace to answer or to change at that time. But I could now see that's the world, whatever happens. Now, born again, I will not follow the way of the world. That's transformation. Nobody com com uh, compelled me. All I knew is that I received salvation by grace through faith. And things were different. I'm sure you know that I went to a school that taught us, no God, 
know this, know that. Of course, I didn't accept that kind of philosophy, but I used to, you know, take things from the school. And I used to get books from the library, not returning them, just kept them. And I used to take our letter that, you know, the principal were write and write about school fees and all that. And I used to read that to my dad. And I'll say, they told us to buy this and to buy this, which was all a lie. But, you know, that's the way of the world. Everybody did it, but now. I knew that that will not sell in heaven. So I went to the principal and I told the principal, Sir, this is what I did. I used to just steal those library books. I didn't know the details about restitution, but my conscience will not allow me to follow what others were doing. And I confess everything and ask for pardon. And, uh, you know, a principal, he said, I understand, you're a good boy. You're one of my best uh, students in this school. I said, yes, but I need to confess this. That's what the grace of God does, that the grace of God transforms us. Of course, I had to tell Daddy too, he used to take money from your you know dress i used to you know lie and say buy this buy this so as to get the money that is the evidence of real salvation by grace through faith and you say be not conformed to this world but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. It will happen in every life. It transformed life. It transparent life. Come to number two now. Number two, we're looking at the transparent godliness through the nation's faith. Transparent godliness. The godliness we have if it's only in the public, so they will know I am godly. When friends are not there, when brothers and sisters are not there, when the people who could challenge you, uh -uh, why are you doing that? Why are you behaving like that? Why are you doing something that will tempt other people? You know, if uh, we are only righteous in the public, when they see me, but when they cannot know I am the originator of this evil thing, then we we'll lose. And we do whatever we want to do. That's not being transparent. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in, the, in, full, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Then in verse uh, 23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised he is faithful and because of that he has promised second peter chapter one reading from verse three in second peter chapter one Verse 3, it says, according to his divine power. The life we live is not according to our human power. It's not according to our brain power. It's not according to 
our natural propensity, the life we live. When the grace of God comes into our heart, it's according to us, his divine power that he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He calls us to virtue, not to vice. You know, the people who say, I have the grace of God, but your life is vicious. Your life is full of vice. Your life is full of sin. Ah, yes, yes, yes. My, don't, don't preach at me. I have grace. You see, the grace of God comes with divine power. And he has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and to godliness through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, it says, Whereby a given unto us, we didn't dig them up from somewhere, and we didn't generate them from our human nature, but he gave us exceedingly great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Partakers of the divine nature. Now, partakers of the divine nature don't steal. Partakers of the divine nature don't commit adultery or fornication. Partakers of the divine nature. They do not leave partakers of the nature of God. They do not leave their promiscuous lives. They used to live in the past. The partakers of the divine nature, by the grace of God, they live transparent lives. And then it says, having escaped the corruption, that is in the world through laws. If you are still being accused that you change books, you steal money from the office, you steal money from the bank, you steal money, and the money that doesn't belong to you, once there's nobody there, you pick it up. You are not saved. You do not have the transforming grace of God that makes us reveal that we have escaped the pollution, the corruption that is in the world through lust. We're coming to number three here. Number three here is the transcending goodness under tried faith. Transcending goodness. There is goodness at the normal human level. And maybe you are like that. And some of us they used to say, that gentle man, very nice, human level. That lady, very nice, human level. When grace comes, it takes us higher than the human natural level. Because now we transcend. Look at that man. He saw the one that was left half dead. Other people passed. Other people will not go near to help him. And he went, the priest, the Levite, he came there, the good Samaritan. When he got there, he stopped. He looked at the man. The man was not dead yet. He picked him up. He poured oil and wine. First aid. That's the normal level. He took him to an inn. He made sure that he was being taken care of. He paid for it. He did not know the man. And then he said... If you finish spending what I've given you to take care of the man, I'll come back. Everything you spend, 
I'm not limiting what you spend. Get the man well. I'll come back and pay for everything. That transcending, transcending, going beyond expectation. When you have heard of righteousness, and you know the righteousness we have been preaching, and you go beyond expectation. When you hear of holiness, and you know the holiness, outward holiness, inward holiness, and you go, you keep all that, and you go beyond that. That's grace, that's grace. Transcending grace. When you care about endurance, enduring trial, enduring temptation, no complaint, no murmuring, you go beyond that. You even help and pray for the people that persecute you. That's transcending. When they slap you on the one cheek and you endure, you don't fight. That's normal. Normal Christian life. When you stay there and you're still going to hell, and you're still going to sustain and support, and you turn the other cheek that's transcending, transcending. When we hear the word of God, and we keep to the word of God, good, normal, truthful, trans, um, transmitting the grace of God in our life. But when now we pray, much more than is expected of us. We transcend, transcend, transcending goodness on that tried faith. In First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. First Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 7. That the trial of your faith. There will be people that will try your faith. He says it's deeper. We're going to try him deliberately, deliberately in your faith. He is a pastor, but he's still working in the office. In that place, they say they preach holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Somebody is going to try you because of who you are. And then you say, I believe in forgiveness. Forgive 70 times, seven times. They are not seeking for the grace to forgive 70 times, seven times. They are going to test you. Will he forgive? Will he overlook? Will he re retain his smile? And then they hear your preaching, one man, one wife. And maybe your wife is still on her way to conversion. Is still on her way to having the grace of God. That wife is going to test you and try you. One man, one wife. And she may almost touch your life. She is testing whether what you say you believe, you can carry it out. And when you remain the husband, like Job remained the husband of his wife, with all the trial, with all that the woman said, that's how we know we have transcending goodness, even under the tried faith. That's why it says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearance of Christ. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, whom? Have we not seen ye love in whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of 
glory. We're coming to point number two. In point number two, we're looking at trampled grace by dead, deadening faith. It tells us in James chapter 2, verse 17. James chapter 2, verse 17. Even so, it, it has not works, it's dead faith. If it has not works, it's dead. Being alone. Before you came to Christ, no works were recommend you to God. But now you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you believe, that belief in the Lord, that faith in Christ, should produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, so even so faith. If it has no love, it's dead, being a lot joy. Even so, faith, if it has no joy, joy in service, the joy of salvation, the joy of knowing the Lord, the joy of living by the grace of God, the joy of suffering, suffering with Christ, suffering for Christ, and suffering for souls. If it has no joy, it is dead faith. Even so faith, if it has no peace, no peace within, no peace with God, no peace with your neighbor, no peace in your home, no peace with the people that interact with you. You're always thinking of what bad thing to do to retaliate. Even so faith, if it has no peace, it is dead being alone. Even so faith, if it has no long suffering, short tempered, hot tempered, furious, always angry, a little thing, a little word makes him angry, makes her angry. No long suffering. Even things that do not concern you, that do not concern him, that do not concern her, he goes over all the world acting as, uh, you know, the militant captain of the whole world. And if anything, what doesn't concern him is done and said anywhere, he gets angry. Everybody must bow, bend, and worship. Have you thought about what right you have in demanding that everyone will be your slave, but you don't have long suffering or meekness? Even so, faith, if it has not meekness, gentleness, you handle everybody as if you are the militant, conquering, captain parent here you are you're young when i say young maybe you're 50 another man is 70 and the 50 year old person wants to handle the seven the 70 year old papa or 70 year old mama like a primary school child even so face if it has no gentleness no meekness, no fidelity. The word there is faith, but it's fidelity. It has no fidelity. It has no faithfulness. That faith is dead, being alone. A faith should produce something positive, something practical, something pleasant with the people we're living. And look at um, Jude. Chapter 1, verse 4. In Jude 1, 4. For these, there are certain men crept in unawares, 
who were before of old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of God of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ those are the people that trample on the grace of God and they turn the grace of God into license for evil into immoral art claiming grace 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 but that grace they have turned into simpleness three things we're looking at number one number one misunderstood grace by nominal churchgoers nominal believers number two misusing grace for non-christian behavior number three misapplied grace by natural beasts look at number one number one misunderstood grace by nominal believers misunderstood grace by nominal believers in James chapter 2 reading from verse 19 James chapter 2 verse 19 thou believest that there is one God thou doest well but remember the devils also believe and tremble nominal Christians say we believe there is God do you fear him do you tremble at the law of God you have spawned I believe in God do you believe him he sent his only begotten son that the only way you can be saved is by believing on his only begotten son the Lord Jesus Christ I believe in God do you believe that his li your life is in his hand that you could leave this world any moment any time I believe in God do you believe that God sees everything you do everything you say do you believe that that evil thing you did and that evil thing you are saying that God is angry with the wicked every day do you believe that except your righteousness shall go beyond the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees you cannot inherit the kingdom of God saying that we believe means that we accept the word of God God and his word are the same when the devils hear of God they tremble Noah heard the flood was coming and the Lord told him to build an ark look at that verse it says he feared and then he had faith the fear we have that judgment is coming the fear we have that if we die suddenly and we die in sin and we die in corruption and we die in our stealing and we're not able to go to God and repent something just happened suddenly and you are gone and you said you believe in God but you didn't believe to the point of having the transformation by the grace of God we just lived and lived and lived as if there will be no judgment day there will be no God that will judge you well you are trampling on the grace of God and you are misunderstanding the grace like nominal church goes Hosea chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 3 Hosea chapter 8 verse 3 Israel 
has cast up the thing that is good, the enemy shall pursue him. Israel, they were always saying, we're children of Abraham, we're children of Abraham, but they cast off the doctrine, the teaching, the law of God. Look at verse 12. In verse 12, I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They believed in God, uh-huh. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. I, you don't even tremble because you are disobeying, you are rebelling against the law of the creator of the heavens and the earth. And eventually, in your life, in your heart, I'm reaching to Him the great things of my law. But they were counted as a strange thing. Do you count the word of God as a strange thing? The man and the woman who leave father and mother, be joined, cleaving to the wife until death do you part. That's strange. That's strange. A man and a woman, not a man and a man, a woman and a woman, joining together. I'm borrowing children from other places, other people that married properly. And then one will say, to get to heaven and to be in the book of life must be a man and a woman. They say, that's strange, that's strange. Pastor, stop preaching that. Because now, if you keep on preaching that, nobody will listen to you again because here we are, we are settled. They're settled in sin. I have reached to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Those are the people that misunderstand the grace of God because they are nominal believers. Believers only in name. Look at number two. Number two is misusing grace for non-Christian behavior. They think grace covers everything. On Christian, non-Christian behavior, grace covers everything. Doing with men outside your home, what? only belongs to your husband. Grace. Grace. They think grace covers everything. Do you with women? What only belongs to the wife? Grace. Grace. That's not grace. That's licentiousness. That's adultery. That's fornication. That's evil. That's promiscuity. That's the natural Adamic life. There are people, they take the grace of God in vain. And they say, this is who I am. And this is what I'm doing. And this is what I will do. That grace that you think about is vain. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 2. In First Corinthians chapter 15, Reading from verse 2, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. You will not believe in vain. I said you will not believe in vain. Look at number three. Number three is misapplied grace by natural beasts. Misapplied grace by natural beasts. We're looking at um, Jude, uh, Jude chapter 1 verse 4. Jude chapter 1 verse 4. For there are certain men crept 
in unawares. As a church, we should be vigilant. As a church, we should open our eyes and see because there are certain men, even women, crept in unawares now. Over here, by the grace of God, we believe the Bible, we teach the Bible, we proclaim the Bible, and any information you want to have, you have from us here. You hear from the word of God that is taught. And we teach plainly. And we teach clearly. And we're not afraid of anyone. And we're not afraid of the consequence of what we preach from the Bible. And so, if you hear anyone inside here, they creep in unawares. And we're not even as vigilant now as we used to be. You know, somebody hears that the uh, GS of deeper life has relocated to England. And then you read that and you don't understand the troublemakers. There are church scatterers. They want to scatter us. What are you doing there? Your pastor has relocated to England. They creep in unawares and they tell other people and the other people tells another person and the other person tells another person. And, you know, I did relocate uh, anywhere. Now tell me, did I relocate? Well, because I went for crusade and conference. And the crusade and the conference is not being transmitted here. But we do it over there. We have time difference. And some of the countries I go, like the one I went in May, uh, seven hours ahead of Nigeria. When it is seven o'clock, I should be preaching here. It be 2 a.m. in that other country. There's no way I could transmit that here because of our time difference. And then, after I finished, and actually, I went to Abba. From Abba, I cross over to the Philippines. From the Philippines, I cross over to Dubai and other cities in UAI. It was a long trip. And after a long trip, after that long trip, jumping into the plane and coming down, going here and there, I needed a few days to rest so that I would not come back weary, tired, and I could not preach again. So I waited. And because I spent that time, they told you that I have Tell me there. I've relocated. Why do you even read all those things? And somebody wrote a letter to me, and he wrote it to London. And he used the address of a church in London. When I opened the letter, the fellow said, I'm writing this to you. I need prayer, I need counseling. But I heard you are now based in London. You will not believe a lie. Yeah. And in our church, people creeping in, they are careless. They are corrupt. They deliberately want to poison your mind against your pastor. Nobody will do that to you. It says, for there are certain men crept in, certain women crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. All those people that creep in, and they are sitting with us here, 
to hear what we are saying and then to go and tell a lie to the world through social media. Ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God. They still profess the uh, in our church, they are members of our church or they are members of other churches and yet they deny the only Lord God our Lord Jesus Christ we're looking at verse 10 there in verse 10 it says but these speak evil of those things which they know not but what they know as nat naturally as brute beasts in those things they corrupt themselves look at verse 12 in verse 12 it says these are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you feeding themselves without fear clouds they are without water carried about of winds trees whose fruit withereth without fruit twice dead they were dead in, in sins and trespasses before they said they came to know the Lord. They came to know the Lord and were made alive in Christ. Then they backslide, they are dead again, twice dead. It says they're twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Look at verse 13. In the next verse, it says, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever grace when it comes into our lives we need to understand don't misunderstand the grace of God we need to use our life don't misuse the grace of God. You need to apply, apply properly so that you don't misapply the grace of God so that your life will be lived by transformation, not by trampling on the grace of God. We're looking at point number three here. Point number three, triumphing grace through distinct, distinguishing faith. Triumphing grace, the grace that triumphs, the grace that overcomes. We come to God and by His grace we triumph over all the past life. All the hypocrisy of the past life, all the hatred and the bitterness of the past life will triumph over the guilt and the condemnation of the past life. Triumphing grace through distinct, distinguishing faith. In Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1, Romans chapter 5. Verse 1, therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 2, in verse 2, it says, by whom, that's by Jesus Christ, he mentioned at the end of verse 1, by whom also we have access by faith access by faith into the grace of God when that grace appears unto us. 
and we accept that grace appearing unto us, then we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. First Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 14. In First Timothy chapter 1, verse 14, and the grace of our Lord Jesus was exceeding abundant with faith, grace, with faith, grace, with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. There's a grace that is triumphant. Three things. Number one, overcoming the world and worldliness by grace through faith. Number two, overpowering our weakness and willfulness by grace through faith. Number three, overturning others wandering in the wilderness by grace through faith. Look at number one. Number one, overcoming the world and worldliness by grace through faith. In uh, First John chapter 5, verse 4. First John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever, whosoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What overcomes the world? Our faith. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, who is he that overcomes the world, but he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The Son of God. He came from heaven to the sons of men so he can lead sons of men to heaven as sons of God. He's the only one that can do that. There is no other name given among men by whom we should be saved. The name is Jesus. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And the whole of the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord. O Lord, save me, and I shall be saved. Heal me, and I shall be healed. In the penitent heart, the repentant heart, Praying, pleading with God for the salvation that comes through faith. And that salvation makes us to overcome the world. I'm looking at James chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 4. James chapter 4. Reading from verse 4. It says, Ye adulterers, and adulteresses, what does that mean? When somebody leaves the husband and does with another man what only she should do with the husband, she is an adulteress. Church woman, outside woman, popular woman, when she leaves the husband and does with another man what he should do with the husband that's adulterous when a man leaves a wife and does with the another woman the thing he should do only with the wife she he is an adulterer now. 
he may not even hide it. The wife may be there, and the man uses bold face. I'm independent. 50-50. I'm giving you enough time. I'm going to give this other woman the same thing I've been giving you. He is an adulterer. And now it says, he adulterers and adulteresses. What it means is we are the bride of Christ. He is the bridegroom. And Christ shed his blood and paid the whole price. And he makes us, as we believe, the bride of Christ, the bridegroom. And that person, the bride of Christ, a man, Bride of Christ, a woman, leaves Christ and befriends the world and gives attention to the world and loves the world. That's the spiritual adulterer. That's the spiritual adulteress. Look at that. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. The enemy of God. We need to overcome that. Small thing, little touch, big embrace, and all that with others who are not your wife, your husband. Avoid that. Overcoming the world and worldliness. We're looking at First John chapter 2, reading from verse 15. First John chapter 2, verse 15. Love not the world. They are dancing, the music, their wine, their cigarettes. Their marijuana, their hot drugs, their ceremonies, their festivals, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man, any pastor, any member, any minister, if any man, if any woman, an office holding woman, in the church, anywhere, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not in her. In verse 16, verse 16 tells us, for all that is in the world, their festivals, their tradition, their dancing and celebrating all the things that are of the flesh. It, it says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Verse 17, and the world passeth away and the laws thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. 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 We're looking at number two here. Number two is overpowering our weakness and willfulness by grace and faith. The material reference there is talking about Peter. Willfulness, self-confidence. The Lord told him this will happen. Said, not possible. To death, I will follow you through unto death. Pray. Watch. Because though the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. Go to God in prayer. The Lord Jesus Christ told him, 
pointedly. This will happen. The remedy is that you have grace and faith. You go to the Lord in prayer so that you can overturn, overpower, overrule your weakness and willfulness. Well, you know the story. He didn't take heed to that. You know, I have uh, uh, to speak pointedly and directly. And that's what, what we're teaching. So that you'll discover yourself. And so that you will take care that the things that God is pointing at, you don't dodge your head, you don't uh, shrug your shoulder and say, not me. Pay attention. The weakness of your life, the willfulness of your life can only be overcome by grace and faith. You will overcome. I will overcome. Number three. In number three, we're talking of overturning others wandering in the wilderness by grace through faith. Wandering in the wilderness, others. That's what they did. But thank God, Joshua did not follow them. Thank God, Caleb did not follow them. Caleb and Joshua said, let us go up at once. We are well able. We can overcome. We will overcome. We will overturn the plan of the enemy on our lives. We will overcome. But all the others decided no. They were going to wonder. You might be a person who is very near another fellow. He is hearing the same word. Is eating from the same table, is drinking the same water from the well of salvation, but is prone to wandering, but is prone to willfulness, but is prone to the wilderness life. But like Caleb, like Joshua, you make up your mind, you kneel the Lord before knowing Him. You came to the Lord before knowing her. And if he or she, prone to wandering, prone to worldliness, prone to the things that will hinder him or her from getting to the land of promise, you have to make up your mind yourself like a Caleb, like a Joshua. And you say, I've made up my mind, I purpose in my heart that, will not, that I will not defile myself. Whatever you see others do, in whatever direction you see others go, make up your mind, you will have the victory, the triumph, and the overturning power not to be like other people. You will overcome. I will overcome. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 16. Proverbs chapter 21 verse 16. The man, of course the woman, that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Remember, the brother, the sister, that wanders out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. If he remains there until Christ comes, all the worship, all the service, all the teaching, all the attending this, attending that, will be in vain. Even though he appeared, she appeared like a believer, but because he's prone to wandering, wandering, wandering to the congregation of the dead, 
if he dies in that condition, we have labored in vain over him, over her. He or she that wanders like that and remains in the congregation of the dead until the physical death will spend eternity in hellfire forever and ever. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, it says, With my whole heart have I sought thee, O oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. Let me not wander from thy commandments. Verse 11. In verse 11, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. The word of God were here needs time to settle in our heart, to transform our life. And to make something so settled that it becomes your second nature. Just like now, you're born again and you're not likely to go and pick a cigarette. It's, that, that's not just your way. And Satan knows that. He'll not even tempt you on that. Just like now you are born again and you're not going to go into all the paintings of the world, palming of the world, the jewelry of the world, the Satan will not even come and tempt you all that. The same thing in every other area of your life. Get the word in. Soak the word in. Pray the word in. Live the word out. Your word, thy word, have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Amen. 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 Now, please don't be offended. I've noticed when we finish like this and we say, let us pray. Then we stand up, we bow our head. <laughs> I don't know what we're doing, but we're not praying. We're just meditating. And you know, I listen very often to the messages were preached 30 years ago, 40 years ago. I have them on my system, on my iPhone. And when I listen, at the end, the people pray. Oh, they pray, they pray. And you could hear 40 years ago prayer. But today, we will pray. And um, you're not praying to satisfy me. You're praying to have grace to do what we've heard. And to have the faith, living faith, lively faith, loyal faith that we have in the Lord. And that faith will transfer the word into our heart and no offense. Amen. Amen. The messages I listened to, I remember those days. When I finished preaching, you know, either that day or, you know, that week, somebody will come to me and say, Pastor, you know, that last Monday Bible study, it's like you were talking to me. I see somebody reported me to you. Pastor, that was my life, but things have changed. Amen? Amen? It will be like that today. Amen. Nobody gets offended. The pastor was so clear. You know, that's how, how I've always been. Pray for me that I will not change. Amen. So, today, we're going to rise up. We're going to pray. We're going to really, really pray. And God will bless you. Let's rise up now. Everything we've heard... Let us bring to the throne of grace that the Lord will grant us grace to be doers of the word. Dead faith, deadly faith will not change anyone. 
Let's have transforming grace. Through definite faith, decisive faith. Definite faith. Decisive faith. I've decided to follow Jesus. Not turning back. Not turning back. Tell the Lord. Friends, they forsake me. Push me aside. Neglect me. Friends, return. But I have decided to follow Christ. No turning back. No turning back. The world behind me, all their festivals, all their traditions, all their ceremonies, all their funeral services, the way they do it, all their festivals, the world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. The things I dropped in the past when saving grace came in. Those things I dropped in the past may be knocking at the door. Let me in. Let me in. Be frivolous again. Let me in. Laugh off your head. Let me in. Old friends, old boyfriend, girlfriend, same partners, trying to get back. Let me in. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Definite faith, dynamic faith, decisive faith. If your life is becoming ordinary, common, just like the life of your neighbor sinners. Wake up. Let not the grace of God in your life be in vain. Be different. Be distinct. Live in transparent godliness. Transparent. If your pastor were to come to you, your office, your home, look over your shoulder, what are you reading? What are you viewing? The pastor will not have any cause to be sorrowful over you. Your life will be a life of transparent godliness. A life of transcending goodness, transcending higher, greater, above normal, beyond normal, 
transcending goodness even when your face is under trial no anger persecutors of course you know persecutors are unbelievers and I call them say by any name hold any title if they persecute the righteous they are righteous The son, Isaac, was persecuted by the one who was born of the flesh. And when those worldly people, nominal Christians, Those who live and act as if they have never heard the word of holiness of heart. When they persecute you, try your faith. You have transcending goodness, no curse. No anger, no fighting, no insult, no assault, no retaliation, no revenge, no picking the stone they throw at you and throwing it at them. No, have transcending goodness. Where your faith is tried. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't come to such a Bible study like this in vain. Don't serve in vain. Don't pray in vain. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. Don't misunderstand the grace of God. Don't misuse the grace of God. Don't misapply the grace of God to justify the nominal believer's character. Some see you are going the wrong way. Leave me alone. Don't you see my power? I can still carry the pillars at the gate. Put them on my shoulder and walk away. I have anointing. Power. But the man kept on and on and on. The father figure, the mother figure in his life said, Something, my son, where are you going? I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. He thought he had anointing. When he had power over Delilah, grace. Grace, grace. Don't misunderstand that word. Grace. 
don't misuse that word. Grace, don't misapply that word. If truly you have grace, there will be salvation there. If truly you have grace, there will be transparent godliness there. If truly you have grace, there will be transcending goodness there. Pray that the grace of God will keep on working in your life triumphant, victorious, conquering, triumphant grace available for you, for me. Overcoming grace available for you and for me. The grace that overpowers a weakness, a willfulness available. It will help you. And the grace that overturns the life of wilderness journey that others are taking available for you. And that grace is sufficient for you. It will keep you holy righteous godly until the final day in jesus name we pray the lord answer your prayers the lord grants you more grace higher grace greater grace the lord will hold you up by his right hand the devil may a uh, kind of tent but you will triumph in jesus name father in the mighty name of jesus we well, thank you for everyone every child of god every brother every sister every minister every pastor every worker everyone literally lord show your love higher and higher greater and greater brother and brother for everyone in jesus name where we'll be careless in the past lord we pray forgive forget and renew every life in jesus name lord every moment every day every day every week Every week, every month, every month throughout the year, abundant grace for everyone. Sufficient grace for everyone. Overcoming grace for everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, your word will not be lost on us. Everyone will profit by the word we have heard today. Make your people stronger. Make your people purer. And make your people walk in the valley of the shadow of death without any stain and without any weakness, without any sickness or messenger of death touching everyone in Jesus' name. Higher life for everyone. Holier life for everyone. Happier in the Lord for everyone in Jesus' name. You are a good God. You have done good to everyone. Your grace continue with everyone. Godliness continue with everyone. And the goodness of the Lord continue with everyone, brother, sister, here, there, everywhere that we are studying together in Jesus' name. It is done for me. It is done for you. It is done. 
In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. God is happy with you. And you'll be happy in the Lord in Jesus' name.